players. 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 Players own. Players own. Players own voice. Players own voice. It's Players Own Voice, a podcast from CBC Sports. My name is Anastasia Busas, two-time Olympian, and today we're asking, when is an athlete more than an athlete? Chris Mosier might be the best candidate to answer that. He's the first openly trans athlete on an American national team. He's got a whole lot of weight on his shoulders, but the duathlete is more than up to the job of representing, competing, and helping an emerging generation of athletes find their place in sport. Chris Mosier has perspective on male privilege that should give everyone pause for thought. Lost to consider today, so let's be at it. Chris Mosier, thank you so much for being here, buddy. Thanks for having me. It's been a minute. Yeah. You keep getting better looking every time I see you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, we got that going for us. It's going to be a total love fest right now. <laughs> How's life? How's training? It's so good. I'm uh, in the middle of my training season. I just did a U.S. national championship um, last month and made my fifth national team and I'm getting ready for triathlon and more nationals coming up. Wonderful. So, what, duathlon, triathlon, like, double sport athlete? You just wanted to leave our single, us single sport athletes in the dust? Well, really what it was is I started off as a runner and worked my way up to a triathlon. So I, I worked my way through all of the running races that I thought you were supposed to do. Um, as a new runner, I thought distance was better than anything else, and so I did. 5k 10k half marathon marathon and then an ultra marathon and was looking for that next challenge and for me that was switching sports completely i bought a bike taught myself how to swim and did my first triathlon and when i did my first try i i won my category but it was in the women's category and i didn't really feel comfortable with that um at that time i was having a lot of questions and uh, thoughts about my gender and probably the reason that I became a do athlete is that I didn't have to swim. So triathlon is swim, bike, run, and do athlon is run, bike, run. For me, the swimming piece was the hardest, not just because I taught myself how to swim, but I'd have to show up in a swimsuit and access locker room spaces. So for me, that was my biggest challenge when I was thinking about my gender and thinking about how I wanted to participate in sports. And duathlon just presented itself as another option for me, and it turned out I was okay at it. When was the exact moment that you realized you identified as male? It's funny. I I always say that it's it's a lot of moments over time, right? But there was one particular moment where I realized that I had to do something about it. And that was my birthday when I was turning 29. I was in a restaurant with my now wife and we were sitting there and someone came up and I think they must have said, hey ladies, can I take your order? And just in that moment, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I remember I ordered my burrito because it was my birthday. (laughs) Of (laughs) course. Birthday burrito. And when that person walked away, I just started to sob at the table and I, I remember my wife looking across at me like, you know, for me, crying is not something that I publicly do. And I felt a lot of shame around that. But in this moment, I couldn't, there was nothing else that I could do. And I had to leave the restaurant. I was crying at the table, couldn't catch my breath. She asked if I wanted to leave. I went out to the sidewalk and basically in New York City, just crumbled to the ground. And it was probably 30 minutes. I Like the burrito came, we took a cab home, and I still was crying. And I just think at that moment, the first thing that I could say when I finally could talk was, I never thought my life would be like this. Like the, the life that I was living wasn't the life that I thought I was meant to live and that I knew that I was meant to live. And it was sort of all of these moments of not feeling accepted in sport, not feeling like people saw me the way that I saw myself that caught up with me to think like, I can't live another year of my life like this and I need to do something about it. Beyond that, I would say, like, I knew who I was as a person at the age of four. Like, yeah. I remember a very young age running around with kids in the neighborhood with my shirt off as, yeah. a, as a little kid and my aunt pulling me around the back of the house saying, you can't run around like this. Little girls don't run around with their shirts off. And I didn't understand at that time, like, what the difference was between me and yeah. the other people in the neighborhood. And I had, you know, situation after situation growing up that I can look back on now to say, 
I've always had a very strong sense of myself. The trouble was that not everyone reflected that back to me. People didn't see me the way that I knew that I was. Seeing yourself in a way that was not reflected back to you from society, how did that affect your mental health? I always describe it like I was a video game character, mm -hmm. right? Like in the time before transition, I didn't understand the term transgender until much later in life. Like even as someone who now identifies as transgender, I did not know any trans people. I didn't see positive representations of trans people. And I didn't even understand that it was an identity that I could have until I was out of college. If, in terms of mental health, I navigated the world for many years like that video game character that I would leave the house every morning on full power. And then things would happen throughout the day where someone would, would say she, mm -hmm. or someone would question my gender. And each of those times it would be like a little hit to my power meter, mm -hmm. right? And, the, and there's no magic mushrooms or superstars to power <laughs> up throughout the day, right? No and Mario. Just, exactly, and I would come home the little shell of a person and have to recharge overnight to do it all again. In 2016, it's a big year. It's a big year. <laughs> it's a big year. You were the face, you were the engine behind changing the IOC policies about trans athletes. So in 2015, I made my first U.S. national team in sprint duathlon. And I knew when I made that team that I would be ineligible to compete in the world championship in 2016 because the International Olympic Committee policy said that transgender athletes needed to have a full surgery, meaning internal and lo external lower surgery. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think that was something that athletes needed to have in order to participate. It doesn't make me a better athlete. It's not something that I wanted to do. And I knew in the lead up to that, that making Team USA would put me in a position where I would have the opportunity to advocate for change. And also, it would probably be a, a year of talking about what's in my pants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> so it was, it was actually kind of scary going into it because I knew it would just put me in such a public position. And the whole thing is around, like, genitals, essentially, right? Yeah. So it was around that. So I got some lawyers and challenged the policy. Uh, there was a lot of, um, first, a lot of, of just questioning, you know, writing to people, am I eligible? Can I compete? Looking for that yes or no answer and then challenge the policy. Um, they convened a, a special meeting, and in about November 2015, I think it was announced in January 2016, announced the new guidelines for transgender athletes, which removed the requirements for surgery and just you know, opened doors for trans athletes to uh, not have to modify their body in, in those ways. And also, it loosened the requirements for hormone treatment. And so it enabled transgender men to compete with men uh, without restriction and lowered the time period for transgender women to be eligible to compete. To be uh, to be eligible to compete, right? How do you approach explaining hormone therapy and water restrictions to people that are are? Uh, and I, I mean, I, I say this not slighting, but ignorant to what it means to be a trans athlete. Yeah, so I just, you know, explain my situation. First of all is that I'm a transgender man. I was assigned female at birth. I take testosterone, and with that I get a therapeutic use exemption form uh, where I have to fill out doctor's paperwork and document all of my uh, testosterone shots and uh, amounts of use and make sure that I'm within what they say is quote-unquote typical male range. Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly being monitored, and I have to renew that every year to make sure that I can compete with men. Um, and it, it's a it's an interesting process. It's it's been uh, it's it's been a little, it was a little bit of a challenge initially to get to get through that. And I think I've got it down now, um, <laughs> and I understand why they do it. Um, the difference is that my experience as a transgender man is very different than the experience of trans women. A lot of the policies that are in place are to prevent or prohibit transgender women from competing with women, um, and a lot of that goes to the stereotypes and myths about trans athletes about who is a good athlete and the sexism behind sports. The people automatically assume that someone assigned male at birth will be a better athlete than someone assigned female at birth. So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I think that I always try to frame it up in saying that even within sexes, there is a, a vast range of hormone levels. And so mm -hmm. the typical, the range for men is 
is quite large. It's hundreds of points of testosterone. And so uh, men can fall anywhere within there. And we know that for female athletes, there are ranges Absolutely. of testosterone levels. Um, and we're, we're all built differently. Um, we all come beyond testosterone, uh, which is the single kind of hormone that they, that they use to determine uh, eligibility. Beyond that, we all have different advantages as people, right? So some of us are tall, some mm -hmm. of us are have a more fast twitch muscle fibers, mm -hmm. and and you know I think when we're thinking about competitive advantage, we need to understand that it doesn't just boil down to hormone levels. When I was competing, I remember we would have to do blood work, and it was just insane how, mm -hmm. you know, just the wide variety of of where your testosterone would fall. Yeah, and um, they say even for, for elite athletes, like for your Olympians, that there's a crossover range between women and men. Yeah. And so there's definitely, you know, women who are on the higher end and men mm -hmm. who are on the lower end. And particularly when you are training so much, you know, that can throw off your hormone levels Completely. greatly. So. Yeah. How many times do you have to pee in a cup, bud? <laughs> well, fortunately, not a lot. And it's because, <laughs> it's because I'm not in the Olympic pipeline because duathlon is not an Olympic sport. How has the athletic community supported you, received you? It's been awesome, I really have to say. And a big, a big part of this, I have to say, is my male privilege. And I don't say that lightly. I say that, that in a way that needs to be discussed to say, I transitioned from being a masculine presenting woman who was in a relationship with a woman to being perceived as a straight white man. Mm -hmm. And it certainly plays out in and outside of sports that you know, essentially, as I mentioned, people have thoughts about who is a good athlete and people preference a certain type of athlete in terms of masculinity and they also assume that anyone assigned male at birth will be better than someone assigned female at birth. So as a transgender man, I am not at all perceived to be a threat. And I think that was when I first came out, people said, oh, you wanna compete against men? Okay, buddy, good, yeah, no good luck, no good problem. Luck. Yeah. You're gonna be a middle of the pack guy. And for me, that never sat well. And you know, even when I, I won my first race overall as male, and the second place competitor came up to me, and you know, great sportsmanship. And when they later found out that I was trans because they friended me on Facebook, you know, I got a message that said, "Congrats! I think that's awesome. I'm you know proud of what you're doing." And I just you know it was kind of shocking along the yeah. way that I have situation after situation like that. And and there have been you know I have been slurs and comments and things like that. But really, overall, big picture, um, I, w I expect that those things will happen, sadly. But the support that I've received in the athletic community has been incredible. Where do you identify on the LGBTQ spectrum? I identify as a trans man, and I identify as queer. What does queer mean? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm 12 out of 10 gay. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, what does queer mean to you? Uh, queer for me is, so, you know, when people assumed that I was lesbian because I was yeah. with a woman before transition, it really never sat well with me. It mm -hmm. was a term that I did not identify with at all. And I would say gay before I would say lesbian, even though I was perceived to be a woman because it didn't fit because I didn't feel like a woman. And so I think that was an early indicator that language was super important yeah. because even a word that by anybody's um, image of me, that word would apply, but it didn't feel right for me. So queer is a word that I, I can kind of take to mean, uh, it encompasses all of the ways I want to express myself. Mm -hmm. Like I am attracted, I say my sexual orientation is actually David Beckham. Oh, but, me too. Yeah, right? oh, I love him, God. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm married to an incredible cisgender woman. And so, yeah. um, you know, so I, I use it as a way to, to try to encompass uh, the ways that I want to express myself and my identity. Castor Semenya, can yeah. we go there? Yeah, we can go there. I mean, I just can't believe that this is still such a hot topic after so long. Let the girl run. Yeah, you know, it's incredible. The changes that have happened in the policy in the IAAF, yeah. um, the policy changes that came about are really very specifically and clearly targeted to prevent her from succeeding as an athlete. Mm -hmm. I think that it is rooted in racism mm -hmm. and uh, is, is really 
another example of targeting black and brown bodies in sport, particularly women, you know, the way that I, the reason this doesn't make sense to me is we've seen other athletes who have had success in, the, in recent years who have not been targeted or questioned in the same way. Um, and, and not as a call out because I think she's an incredible athlete, but when Katie Ledecky was in the pool beating women by a full pool length, I'm talking not even on my TV screen, she's thought of as a once in a lifetime athlete. Yeah. She's thought of as just an incredible person who's breaking barriers in sport. But when Caster Semenya is winning, you know, she's not given that same sort of credit. And a lot of it is, is uh, I believe, to be anti-blackness, but I also believe it to be based on appearance. She is relentless in her expression of herself. Mm -hmm. I think that she is very authentically who she is. Mm -hmm. and, and on social media, she's very clear about who she is. And I don't think that people are down with that. She appears more masculine than other women, and I think that she's been targeted for that. For an athlete that even identifies as LGBTQ, it's, it can be just a difficult conversation to have, and I need to educate myself too, and I can sometimes shy away from the, from the conversation. Mm -hmm. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Right, so we all have these spots where we could have greater awareness, but it's not even on our radar that we are not informed about it. Yeah. And it sounds like for you, it's kind of on your radar now, but there's this sort of, I think, a general fear of doing the wrong thing, of saying the wrong thing that many people have that prevents us from doing anything. Mm -hmm. You know, even as a trans man, I find it really hard because when I'm having these conversations, I want to be conscious of both my history in women's sports and the importance that it was and, and remains that we have spaces for women and girls to participate in sport. I often feel like women have a harder time talking about it. And a lot of the fear is that there's going to be someone who comes in and dominates women's sports. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the pushback that people have about trans athletes participating. And the fact is that we haven't seen that happen. Yeah. You know, a lot of this is based on myths and stereotypes and fears. Right? Like, what were the earliest things that you remember hearing about trans people? The first things first is, you know, it's like, okay, well, how does that differ from drag? And mm -hmm. then a lot of the times people put it back on you as, as a female athlete um, who had the privilege of competing at the highest level in my sport. It's, uh, it's like, well, how would you feel if, uh, you know, Sven Kramer decided to he's the best Dutch guy ever, like goat of mm -hmm. speed skating. Sven Kramer <laughs> decided to transition. And 100%, mm -hmm. and I hate to admit it, but it's like, well, I don't know. I don't know how. It, I, I would think that he would just be naturally more, he would be more talented. He would be stronger. He would have all of these advantages than anyone else that's, mm -hmm. that was, you know, cisgender, born, born female, identifies as female. Mm -hmm. um, and I hate to admit my ignorance, but it's also like I'm kind of being a fraud if I don't. And you feel super vulnerable as an athlete when you're asked questions. I mean, I would ask you, what is a tangible thing that I can do to make not just sports, but the world better for trans kids? 84% of trans youth never play a team sport. Wow. You know, we're driven out of sport at such a young age, robbed of those opportunities to have the social connection with our peers, to learn things like dedication and leadership and communicating with others and how to win gracefully and how to lose and bounce back. You know, all those great things that you and I would say probably are our defining characteristics and values that we hold yeah. so close. Yeah. We learn through sport. We want to encourage everybody to, to, to have the opportunity to participate with their peers in a way that feels safe and comfortable. For the LGBTQ and especially trans communities, is sport part of the problem or is it part of the solution? I think it's both, just because of the nature of our problem being society as a whole, right, is, is not accepting, accepting and fully inclusive. Um, and that's regardless of where you're at in the world. Certainly in some places, it's much worse. Uh, it, it can be death penalty. It can, it can be, literally be a matter of life and death to express your identity. You know, people can rally around sports like, like nothing else, yeah. right? Like I always say, I might 
I might dislike my neighbor down the hall because they listen to music late at night and the hallway always stinks like garbage. But <laughs> if we both we both love the Chicago Cubs, we can we can rally around yeah. that when we see each other, right? And that's a bond that we have, and sport does that. Is sport a safe place for trans kids right now? It kind of depends on where you're at, but the general answer would be no. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think that there are still young people who don't know that it's okay for them to be themselves and still participate in sport. And there are still organizations that are not allowing young people to be themselves and participate in sport. And so, you know, it's a it's a challenge then because we don't see out trans athletes in the higher levels because yeah. they've been driven out of sport yeah. at a young age. There's a, uh, an invisibility. Absolutely. It's blanketing everything. Mm-hmm. I don't think that I ever thought when I was younger that I would live to be 30 years old, right? I thought I would, I, 25 might have even been a stretch for me. Every single year has been better than the last, and I'm, yeah, I'm so happy. <laughs> you love yourself. Yeah, and it's cool for, like, the first time that I think I was a really confident kid, mm-hmm. and something happened where that got shook out of me, yeah. you know, and that was that was late junior high, high school, when probably around puberty time, right, when people started to not see me as the way I saw myself, when I started to realize that uh, my path wasn't straight, uh, a direct path to the six-pack and flat chest that I thought that I would always have. You have it now, buddy. Yeah. I've seen you on Instagram. (laughs) It took me a little while to get there, but, you know, I think there was that time in between where I lost a lot of confidence in myself, and I I lost my sort of radiance, and I feel like mm-hmm. I've really gotten that back. Like, I feel like now I, I have a joy for life and a passion for what I do in a way that I hope is infectious to other people. Chris Mosier, thank you so much, buddy, for taking the time. It's been a minute. Once again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this interview by saying you get better looking every time <laughs> I see you. Thank you so much God, for having me. Rico Thank you. Suave around here. <laughs> um, people can follow me online at the Chris Mosier for, um, for, I don't know, pictures and of, of Rico Suave and <laughs> of his six pack because he's got one. <laughs> but also in in doing the work that I'm doing, one of the coolest things that's that has happened for me is having the opportunity through social media to speak with people who are either struggling or have positive experiences of being out in the community. And so I feel like my role here is just to make it easier for the next athlete who comes after me. So that's what I want to do. Thank you. That was Chris Mosier recorded deep inside the Rogers Center, the stadium formerly known as the Skydome here in darkest Toronto. Players Own Voice podcast is a CBC Sports production. Ken Wolf is the executive. David Giddens is the producer. Email your comments to us at playersownvoicepodcast at cbc.ca. Social media, hashtag CBCPOVpodcast. I'm Anastasia on Insta and all that jazz. Thanks for listening.